My name is Iran. As was mentioned, I'm a senior software engineer at Intel. I'm seeing myself, not the slides. Uh, I've been working in the advanced analytics department for the past eight years. And today I want to talk to you about a solution we recently developed for our sales and marketing at, at Intel, um, building and maintaining a knowledge graph. A little bit about myself and where I come from. At advanced analytics at Intel, we build and deploy machine learning and artificial intelligence solutions across many of Intel divisions, from the manufacturing process in order to improve um, quality and reduce test costs, up until sales and marketing in order to increase revenue, which we're going to deep dive a little bit about today. We also have products facing the outside world, such for the healthcare industry, helping Parkinson uh, uh, patients analysis, and for the um, automotive industry, when we work with Mobileye and analyzing um, um, automobile information. Advanced Analytics is composed of 200 uh, people, from data scientists, machine learning engineers, and product managers. But today I want to talk to you a little bit about sales and marketing, because this is where we deployed our knowledge graph. The sales and marketing department at Intel is huge. They have thousands of people covering hundreds of thousands of accounts, and they can offer them hundreds of products, from CPUs to memory and RAM. And this enormous complexity may lead to some missed business opportunities. This is why we created the Sales AI platform, in order to bridge the gap of those missed opportunities and help by collecting data customer data in real time, detecting intent to buy and potential opportunities, recommending the appropriate response, and recording the results back into our models in order to make them more robust. In the past five years, our sales AI platform have increased Intel's revenue by more than $450 million. We've deployed many solutions for account managers. And to give you a little bit of context, one such solution is called the Sales Assist, as it assists account managers with giving them leads about their respective customers. The Sales Assist provides additional activity information about customers with relevant information. For instance, the account manager can look at the screen and see that company A have recently viewed a product that it never purchased before. On the other hand, Company 234 is planning to attend a conference. This could be very viable information. But through the years, we created many such solutions in different parts of the sales and marketing teams. And we started thinking, wait a minute. If you want to see everything we know so far about Company A, can we? Or do we have only these silos of information? Can we get a more broader view? And the answer was no. We don't have everything centralized in one place, and we're losing this uh, feeling of unified data. So we decided to create a centric data uh, source, a knowledge graph, that would unify all our external data, internal data, and new insights that we learned along the way. So why specifically a knowledge graph and not throw everything into a document DB? Well, everybody's talking about it. So you probably know that knowledge graphs are a great way to represent relationships. They are very explanatory. You can give the motivations behind your recommendations, explain it to people in normal sentences. You can infer knowledge directly from the graph. As long as you keep it up to date and valid, you can run the same algorithm and quickly get new knowledge about a specific entity and fast because it's extremely efficiently managed, and everything is close. It's one hop, two hop, three hops away. And you can always store back the insights that you just collected. I just realized that the slides are not my latest, latest slides, so I hope uh, I won't lose track. So we decided we wanted a knowledge graph. But how does one create a knowledge graph? We started thinking, can we take all our accumulated knowledge and simply turn it into graph formation? This seems like 
going to a lot of data sources and creating graphs from data which is unstructured, most of it, seems like an impossible chore. So we decided to start now, meaning we would choose a use case and we would record any new activity and insight into a knowledge graph structure. And I'll illustrate by the first use case we chose to cover. A company enrolls into Intel's program in order to buy products. While it enrolled into Intel's program, it mentioned that it's part of the NAR IoT industry and that it's a builder in those industries. So we can record that. Later on, company A continued to purchase product X and product Y. We know that product X and product Y, because we have the product uh, graph structure, belongs to the data center. Later on, we browsed company A's website and we discovered our smart medical devices, which suggest that company A actually belongs also to the healthcare industry. Then there was a social media tweet. Company B is about to invest in company A. So we can connect company A with company B. And fortunately, maybe we already have company B in our graph database, in our knowledge graph, that is. And we have a lot more information about things that related to company A. Company A continued and browsed Intel.com, and we recorded that activity to showing that we're, they were uh, seeing interest in cloud-related products. We can continue on and on by recording multi-source activities, enriching our graph with external data, relaying on the basis of our internal data. And what's amazing about that, we got a really dense picture of information, but we started only with this from our internal data sources. And as things feel like they're flowing in, it was only natural that we would create a stream processing framework that any new piece of information that flows in would be persisted in a graph uh, formation. And we did that ju just that. We created an asynchronous processing framework for growing a knowledge graph, as we've just seen. We thought, what are the capabilities we would like this system to have? And we thought about four main capabilities that we found crucial that the system would possess. And we created a component for each one of them. The architecture, by the way, is a microservice architecture. And in high level, it's fairly simple. It's written on top of Kubernetes for easy deployment. Everything's got a nice Docker file. Everything is in a pod, easy to deploy. And the components are these. For loading internal information that we do all the time, we created the loaders. Then we knew we needed to transform information into graph formations, so we created the transformers. But that was not enough. We wanted external data. We wanted to go out to the world and get enrich our data, so we created the extractors. Last, we wanted to save everything into a graph database. In our case, we chose Neo4j, so we created the graph builder. Now, on top of that, in order to keep data relevant, or data relevance, that is, we created the refreshers. And everything that goes into the system must pass the message bus. So we created an uh, ad hoc API for analytical models to have access to the system in order to add their own edges or update existing edges and nodes. And now we're going to talk a little bit about each one of those components. So the first one is the entry point to the system, the loader. Its entire role is loading data from uh, internal data sources, such as CRMs, ERPs, file systems, and it does just that. It supports a variety of formats, and it can work either with push or with pull. It can periodically pull from a SQL server in the CRM systems, or it can be notified by push from the file system if a new CSV have just arrived. It transforms those records into JSONs, format, and pushes them, publish them to our message bus, to Kafka. And it works continuously in order to insert data. This is the entry point to the system. The basic processing unit 
of our framework are the transformers. They do the heavy lifting, so to speak. They transform information into graph semantics, into graph formations. They take product information and transform it into nodes and edges. They're asynchronous, they're always on, always working, and they're stateless, which by nature makes them extremely scalable and fault tolerance. We use Kafka streams in order to build the transformers. Each one has a dedicated Docker file, which can be extended, and they're configurable entities, which means you configure a transformer per specific entity. For instance, in this example, product. You configure the transformer that every specific field from the information that flows in, what kind of graph semantics it becomes, a nodes, an edge that connects two nodes, etc. We could, and we started training automatic models in order to do this transformation, but we decided to start with a simple configuration in order to do labeling of those transformations to later on replace them by machine learning models. This was not enough, as I mentioned before, we wanted to get external data. So we extended the transformer and created the extractor. The extractor enriches the data with external information, goes out to the world and gets more information about that specific product. It is configured on top of entity like the transformer, it is configured with the data source as well. Each data source needs to have its implementation of a data source interface, so to speak. This is kind of a plugin system. If you want to get external data from Wikipedia, you need to implement how you're going to access Wikipedia and what's the processing going to be like. Because you do not want to get all the information about that specific product from Wikipedia, you want to do some post-processing, maybe run some simple machine learning models in order to get some reasoning before you transform the external information into nodes and edges and publish it back to Kafka to later on be persisted to the uh, graph database. The graph builder, that's the most busy place in the system. All pieces of information gets to the graph builder to be saved into the graph database, into Neo4j. It translates graph semantics, JSONs in the format of nodes and edges, into GQL, graph querying language. We support Cypher, as it's the most prominent one, and I recommend supporting Cypher, as it actually decouples you from the graph database technology, and you can always replace the graph database, though we chose to stick with Neo4j for now. It's important that the graph builder is the only one with right access to the graph database. You want to control this concurrency in order to keep things under control. You do not want any other process to have access to your graph database, um, persisting nodes and edges left and right. So why did we choose Neo4j? Well, first of all, it's extremely mature and stable. It's easy to set up and use, but most databases are these days with Docker and Kubernetes. It uses Cypher, as I mentioned, uh, a great benefit. But for me, the most uh, important thing, it has a great UI. And this is actually a snapshot from our knowledge graph. And I'm saying great UI because if your graph database does not have UI, it's really hard to explain it. If you want data analysts, data scientists, um, developers, everyone that want to get a glimpse of the graph database without writing code and enciphering the results, you should have a nice UI to um, show it and explain it. So this is basically why we chose Neo4j. The last piece was, well, we're going out to the world, we're getting information, but how can we keep it still relevant? So in order to keep data relevant, we created the refreshers. Their entire role is to trigger extractors. They're the only one that query the database since they slowly traverse the graph looking for stale nodes. Once they found a specific stale node, they triggered the relevant extractor in order to get new information and keep this node up to date. 
And they are also similar to the extractor, configured per node, uh, per entity, and per data source. Mm, OK. This is not what I wanted to get, but we'll do this first. Um, one key principle on how to save data into the database was keeping information closed, yet not coupled. This is uh, a principle we found very useful when actually creating the structure. When you ask, um, how do you save data as graph structure, usually the response is, well, entities are nodes and actions are edges. Well, we found a few more, as I will show um, in the slides. And I'll illustrate. Company A, as we know it from before, we scanned its wiki page. And we identified that this wiki page um, suggests that it belongs to the cloud industry. Now, we can do this, but this actually couples company A to something that we learned from its wiki page. And we don't want that, because maybe later on, we will learn, we will learn something new for that, from that same wiki page. In general, you should always keep the source that your data came from and the confident that you have in that new information. So it would probably be better to do this and save a node specifically for the data source. Later on, if we want to run models on all the wiki pages, inferring which industries they suggest, we will not disturb company A as we run models on the wiki pages, and company A simply uh, belongs to the cloud industry through that wiki page. On top of that, if we found two wiki pages for company A, we can simply do this and add a matching or a confidence score to that edge. And later, our algorithms can decide if company A is actually a cloud um, industry company, a software, both of them, or none. So we had that nice infrastructure, and we started thinking, what do we want to do with it? And one of the first use cases we put in is we said it would be nice to see our customers, the sales, what the customers buy, and their partner companies. So how would we configure such a thing? Well, we would first need the sales loader, which will load data from the ERP systems, then a company loader that would interface with the CRM systems, a product loader that would lo uh, periodically update into the product line into the knowledge graph, a corresponding transformer for each one of those loaders, and then a partner extractor. In this case, the partner extractor simply takes the URL we got from the company loader, crawls the website, goes to the partners page, runs some image recognition in order to identify logos and relate them to companies, filters unwanted data, will only keep partner names and URLs, transform them into nodes and edges, and sends them to Kafka in order to later be saved by the graph builder. And after configuring the system this way, we got this. And this is actually a snapshot I took two weeks ago from our knowledge graph, uh, which illustrate why unifying external and internal data can be nice and maybe create new business opportunities. Here, what we see is that we have four entities, basically. We have company, we have URL, we have sales, and we have product. And we can see that we have two Intel customers, which are the orange circles, which are connected by the fact that they both bought SSDs, which are part of our memory and storage product line. Each one of them also have partners. This company, with that URL, has two partners, and the edges said, is in business with. And this one has got four. So maybe this nice view can create new business opportunities with the partners of the companies that already buy from us. So that was all well and good. Let's 
take a look on how we created this structure, again, with the principles of how, how to save the nodes and edges, in what kind of uh, formation. So our, another guideline that we had was every piece of, even if it's an action, but it relates more than two parties, you will create a node from it. And you can see that in sale. And basically, you can see that also in URL, but it's say in sale, it's stronger. Because you could create company X purchased product, but then you will never be able to add who sold it, how many, maybe how many on the edge. But if you want to relate it to another node, you simply can't. So it would be better to create nodes for the sale transaction as well. So that was nice to see this unified uh, information, external data and internal data. But then we wanted to know if we can generate new knowledge on top of that data. And when you have a, a strong knowledge base and when you have a um, verified knowledge graph, you can create and enrich that graph simply by running analytics models without going to external sources. And this is a paper in, in, in the process of being published um, in the coming weeks where we did customer segmentation to vertices, to verticals that is, using the knowledge graph. And these specific machine learning and deep learning models have relay on Wikipedia data and Intel uh, activity and web pages in order to infer these verticals. And this was not possible before we had all that information in one place. So if you find this intriguing, you can probably find it in uh, Google Scholar in a week or two. So this was our system. And I hope you found uh, some of the things that we learned beneficial. And I believe I'm done. And I'm open to questions. Yes, and I, and I apologize because I had a few more slides, but this was a little bit out of date. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the nice presentation, and I really like the architecture that you used. Uh, and uh, my question has to do with uh, the data model that you kind of touched upon at some point. So uh, it's a two-part question. Part one. How did you get yourself up to speed? Because indeed, as you pointed out, there's quite some, some trade-offs to be made when designing a kind of graph data model. So how did you educate yourself on, on that? Did you just learn by doing? And B, which is a kind of more specific question, you mentioned that uh, for a specific kind of relationship, you basically create a, no a new node every time you have an instance. So I'm wondering how many instances you currently have in your model and whether you see that approach scaling well? OK, the first part, um, it was hard. We started reading, we, we tried reading a lot of material papers about the subject. There aren't many clear guidelines. Uh, we gave our data scientist uh, team to actually reverse engineer what they needed by the algorithm they would want to run on the data. And basically, they started mapping. And since we did that iteratively, and we didn't do everything in once, each time they came out with a new mapping, and we did just that. We put the mapping. And sometimes it changed. It, it wasn't right on the first, uh, in the first try. So there wasn't any magic here. Um, the second thing, mm, remind me the question. <laughs> I already forgot that. You said that um, you, you made a specific design choice uh, to, uh, to model a certain relationship, which mm -hmm. was to instantiate a new node every time. And I was wondering uh, how many instances you currently have in your, your knowledge graph and whether it's scaling up, this, whether this specific choice is scaling up well so far. And how do you see that playing out? So far, it scales well. We have, I believe, 
around tens of millions of entities in our knowledge graph, uh, maybe even more if you add all the edges. Um, this way, that holding things in nodes makes it easier, and this is our personal opinion, uh, playing around with things, uh, because an edge has more of a, it limits you more than a node. So this is why we decided, basically everything that we could make a node, we made a node. Because then you can uh, specifically now pull out a view of only the nodes of the type you want and play with them. And if you map the nodes to external data sources, then I can say, well, now I want to work only on tweets. And poof, I have only the tweets, because I have nodes of all the tweets. So it makes it really uh, more neat and, and organized. So that was the, the idea. Hello, thank you uh, for an amazing presentation. And uh, my question was more on di a bit different lines. Uh, why did you use knowledge graph in the first place? Maybe you could have used a multi-dimensional graph or something? A what? A multi-dimensional graph. So um, plotting each of these, for example, companies or uh, Twitter-based information on a different level of graph. When you say graph now, you, you, you said multidimensional graph. What I see is, do you mean multidimensional like relational yes, data layer, structures? Yes, layers of each of these graphs connected amongst each other. OK. Um, we wanted that, that, that was the first motivation. I don't know if I mentioned it, that if an account manager wants to see an in-depth view of a specific company, it would be easy to take that subgraph fast in real time and get all the information around it. It's similar to what Google is doing with the knowledge box. You want a specific term, you want to get all the information related to that term, and you can get it in milliseconds only if you, if you use graph structure. If you start joining data from different sources, it will take time. And it's, it's not scalable. Yeah, uh, when I meant multi-layer, it would still be a graph, right? So I don't know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, yeah, I was um, uh, more t talking in the terms of, uh, so, so the company is on, all the companies are on one layer of the graph, and all the other factors about um, uh, uh, some extra data that you had that comes from Twitter and all on another a layer. So wh why would you want to create a layer like a tree? Uh, yeah, kind why, of. Why would you a want to create a tree um, to represent your knowledge? Um, maybe I thought it would be, again, easier to pull if there's a hierarchy. But the, the, the important part here was the relationship, not the hierarchy. Okay. Because there, there is no hierarchy. Like There's nothing. It's not that Twitter is in charge of companies or Twitter is above companies, or companies are above Twitter. They interact with each other. So I don't see the, the, the value in a, in a tree. But maybe I'm missing something totally. So I'll be glad to talk about it uh, after okay. this. <laughs> Thank you. Many thanks for your presentation. Um, my question is about uh, with all this data, how do you control the veracity of this data um, after, I don't know, months, years? Because you are using this data, as you mentioned, for the sales assistant. So how do you control the veracity of this data? How do I the, the quality of this data that uh, your um, refreshers, I don't remember exactly the, the terminology, uh, are gathering the right data. OK, the refreshers, they simply 
uh, triggers extractors, which go out and take the data. And each, each extractor has a, a sort of a post-processing logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, confidence is, is done in, in that stage. Meaning we do not simply go out to Wikipedia, get the entire page, and, and save it. We, we must, first of all, make sure how confident we are that this company and this wiki page are indeed the same thing. So we run algorithms for each one of this matching, a matching algorithm, in order to give it a score. So that's first. And later on, because we keep it in a different node, we can always say, well, now I want to run a different algorithm on all our wiki pa pages and try to give a different matching score later on. And this is because we separated it into nodes, we can do that later on. But we always run algorithms after we extract the knowledge in order to validate it. You don't have a human intervention that is re reviewing the data or the graph? No. No, no it, it's, not, it's not maintainable. It's, it's too much. Yeah. We, we persist. Last time I checked, uh, I think, I don't want to commit, between five and 10,000 uh, entities per second. So it's not huge, but it's, it's a lot. <laughs> We have time. <laughs> so thank you very much.